it appears to me uh, it, that he is attempting to get Mitt Romney elected president because the Fed is sitting on its hands idle while we have an unemployment and labor crisis in this country. Peter Schiff is going to disagree strongly, strongly, strongly and vehemently with that. First of all, I think you overestimate what the Fed could do you know, to help the economy. You, you yeah, don't create economic growth or jobs by printing money. What you do create is bubbles and inflation. You have to remember, it was the artificially low interest rates that were the principal cause of the housing bubble, and therefore uh, the Fed is to blame for the financial crisis that ensued. So right now, we don't need more cheap money. Right? That is preventing the economy from restructuring along the lines that would actually give us lasting economic growth. We need much higher interest rates. Of course, that's going to bring on some short-term pain, but unfortunately, we need that to get the long-term gain. This is the this is the liquidationist Andrew Carnegie. You know, let it let 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 the prices uh, you know let prices find a bottom. Let there be suffering and, and well, mass misery, and that mass misery will will kind of well, wrench wrench the pain out. No, of No, well, remember, there's more misery if we don't bite the bullet, and we didn't follow Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie's advice during the 1920s. Hoover ignored it. He did what Obama is doing. He did what Roosevelt was doing. That's why the Depression lasted through the end of the Second World War. I'm not the economist at the table, so I'll, I'll throw it over to you guys, but I want to make two, two points in response to that. One, in terms of the, 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 whether the Fed did or did not cause a housing bubble. I think one of the things that's important to, to recognize is that if you look at the history of, of capitalist economies, there are all, sides of, all sorts of bubbles that happen all the time, right? Throughout the history of capitalist well, economies, Sometimes with central banks, sometimes without them. In fact, in manias, panics, and crashes, Kilderberger looks at, and this is a, the sort of canonical text, right, on, on, on financial crash, crashes, is that even when you don't have a central bank, they come up with ways to fund the bubbles, right? So, yeah, but it's much bigger when you have a central bank and a government and fiat money, and, and, and we're going to suffer. But, you know, the real fiscal cliff is not this phony one that we're talking about at the end of the year when the budget deficit might actually come down a little bit. The fiscal cliff is when interest rates skyrocket and the government can't afford to pay but, the interest on the enormity of the debt that's been accumulated in the last few years. Um, it, it, Carl, I want you to respond to this. I mean, the, the, the one other thing I'll say is, you know, I think it's important to distinguish, and I think Bernanke does and other people who, 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 who study this, distinguish between how the Fed is operating in normal times and how it's operating in post-crisis times, right? I mean, A crisis that, that that thing, caused. Things, are, things are different when you have tr the fallout from a financial crisis. That it caused. Right. So, so well, first of all, I mean, I, I don't know what Point we want to want to debate this at you know because I probably disagree with everything you said but uh, <laughs> well, you'd be wrong but, uh, uh, but so I don't I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the the Fed caused the 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 housing bubble. Oh well, remember I predicted it in advance. I was alone in that. And the sure, reason I knew like, about it was Peter, because Peter, I understand Peter, how Peter, the Peter, Fed. You were not alone, alone in predicting oh, the housing sure bubble. I was. You were not Ooh, alone. Oh, no, yeah. so, so, so you check were, it out on YouTube. No, no, no. You you were against some of the guys on Wall Street who also don't really know what they're talking about. And <laughs> well, wrong. I won't disagree but, with but, you there. But, but, but you know, I said there was I said there was a bubble. Paul Krugman came and gave a talk in 2007 about how there was going to be a housing how there was a housing. Well, bubble. he wanted, wanted one. Right? He advocated for and it. Dean, he thought it was going to solve our problem. And Dean Baker, I, I, I should note, also true, said this. So, so, but continue. And so lots of lots of us thought that there was a bubble. I mean, well, did we they also predict a financial crisis from from what it would burst? I mean, I did. Oh, but all I mean, right, well, I, did, I, I didn't so, see you out there with me, but all right. Uh, but but furthermore, I mean, so we had we had lots of securitized just securitization. We had CDOs. We had all these products, and I, I think that was probably at the heart of what caused the bubble. And we could talk a lot about well, it was the Fannie and Freddie guarantees well, and, and the cheap money. Okay, okay, let, let's get off the cause. The <laughs> I, I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to talk about the cause right now because I, I want to okay. talk about what we can do now. And I think this yeah. is there is this open question. People on the left and the right, you know, I, I was making a strong case there for Fed action that Fed right. can do things. People say there's nothing the Fed can do. It's it's called so, pushing on a string. I'm so curious yeah, so your the, thoughts the, on that. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, what what the Fed could easily do is simply say that it's willing to tolerate a little bit more inflation, that it would allow inflation to go up to three percent. And I mean, we can we can sit and argue about what we really think inflation is, but we can say this: we we measure the PCE deflator, right? We can say explain the, what that is. Explain yeah. what that is. <laughs> but so personal, keep, just keep let's yeah. keep it. Yeah. Yeah. Personal consumption expenditures is a part of GDP. It's what normal people buy. What are, it's we, a basket of goods. Basket that people of goods are. that people buy. That we go out. The government goes out and buys it every month, and then. Right down literally, it's this amazingly um, thorough process it. in which they go out and they buy right. the goods. They, they, buy it every, they get the, they Hold on one second. Hold on, hold, 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 hold on one second. They calculate how much it costs, right? And so we can just say, look, we'll let that go to three percent, or we'll let that go to four yeah, percent. But and how does making that basket more expensive help people? How does it help the economy if they have to pay more for food? Okay, so, that, that, so, so the there's Fed, several ways. The Fed has. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. There, there, there's several ways. The the most straightforward way is that. 
when, when that, ha that happens because people are spending more money, people are buying more stuff. I mean, you believe in supply and demand, right? So prices go up. But supply doesn't people, go up. Just prices the, go just up. demand. So prices okay, so, rise. So, so demand goes up, right? And then that makes businesses want to supply more stuff. They right. can do this no, now because we have unemployed workers who they can hire right. and then make things. No, so we here, just import the stuff so from here, China. So we here's, so here's a prime example up. of this, right? So we talk about the, the car industry. And this, 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 <laughs> I, this, I, this I also predicted. We want to get into predictions. Right, which is that when that we would have a surge in new car sales, they would go up to four, they would go up to 14 million, right, mm -hmm. and that would result in workers in the Midwest being rehired. And we've seen the unemployment rate in Michigan and in Ohio start to collapse. Mm -hmm. We've grown manufacturing jobs for the first time in something like 20 years. We've had strong, we have growth in manufacturing jobs, and that's happening because people are buying yeah. more cars. And, and inflation here, is not going to create cars. jobs. It's just going to create more misery for the people who are unemployed. Oh, but so, think for a second about how you get inflation, right? So it's not money printing. That's how you get okay, it. so so, but it's not as if you print money and then magically prices go up. Right. Well, sometimes it prevents prices so, from falling, but it's always well, damaging the economy. Well, it's not it's by magic, right? <laughs> so, so, so there's supply and demand. Yeah, when and when you have too much money being stuff. supplied, prices rise. That's it. And okay, so first of all, that is actually not the relationship between uh, the monetary supply and prices. It's not a direct relationship between prices and monetary supply. There's this other thing that you learn in your first year economics class, which is velocity, and how many times those dollars turn over. So oh, what God. we're measuring... Where's the velocity, 820. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, but just how quickly the money... But this is why it's important that we actually measure prices, because we need to find out what's happening to prices, and it's not enough to say what are we doing to the, mo to the money supply. So we look and see what's happening to prices. And the, you know, I should add, you know, we measure prices, and, and one of the big mistakes we make when we measure prices is we never know how much to adjust for quality. So we know quality is rising, so our oh. price increases might even be lower than. Well, a lot of times quality is going are. down. Have you been on an airplane but lately? The, I mean, uh, we're, we, 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 there's a lot of price declines that don't get captured into the CPI. Um, the, uh, but okay. the way to think about what the Fed does is the Fed has two policies. It's uh, two mandates, right? It's trying to think about employment, maximal employment, and it's trying to think about uh, inflation. So the question isn't how does having higher inflation help people? What it, we're trying to do is do something that's not a rocket, I mean, that, that's not very extremely precise, right? We're trying to uh, target something that we have a hard time measuring and that we're not exactly sure how things are going to respond and we're trying to do target two separate things. We're trying to target employment and we're trying to target prices. And we've right. got to tolerate missing a little bit on prices and missing... What I see when I watched the testimony yesterday at the Joint Economic Committee is that one there's one political party that um, very explicitly is saying the kinds of things that you're saying, Peter. You're saying that um, you know inflation is higher than the official headline number. That the Fed doing things like quantitative easing, which is one of the, the sort of unconventional things they did during the crisis to try to increase the monetary supply and kickstart the economy. That that's a disastrous path to follow. Um, Ron Paul obviously has made these ideas quite famous, but it's spread throughout the Republican Party. It's it's now a kind of central Republican sure, Party. But I would idea. say most Republicans don't understand how bad it's going to get when the Fed does the right thing after having done the wrong thing for so long. When they finally let interest rates go up, it's going to be very problematic for a, a country that is so over leveraged. Uh, banks are going to fail. Uh, the government's going to have to default on a lot of its obligations. Because if you just think about how much we've borrowed, you mentioned what happened under Paul Volcker. Let's say in a couple of years, the official funded debt is 20 trillion. If interest rates go to 10%, it's going to cost us a trillion dollars a year right, but just to pay the interest on the national right, debt. People, people have been predicting the interest rate spikes for a while, they've been predicting very high levels of inflation. And it's going to happen. It has not happened well, yet. But, but, but let me ask you, I want to I ask you this, because you're, obviously the, 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 the views that you hold and, and that are, I think, broadly in the sort of same conceptual area as Ron Paul and other people, do you think that those views have become more popular among the Republican Party and, and, have, yeah. have, and have been articulated more yeah. over First, time? actually, my math was wrong. It's $2 trillion a year in interest at, 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 20, at 20 trillion. Sure. So that's, that's the entire tax collection. But look, I don't think that people understand 
how the Fed's role, how instrumental it has been uh, to creating all of the macroeconomic problems that are plaguing us right now. Because by keeping interest rates too low for too long, it has screwed up the economy. We don't save enough. We don't produce enough. We have too many people working in the service sector, in, in government, in, in banking, in, in retail, in healthcare, and education. Meanwhile, we can't produce the things that we need to consume. We have $50 billion a month trade deficits because this economy doesn't work anymore because all the resources are misallocated. It's going to be painful to put them back together. But if we don't do it, we're going to have a real crash in this country okay, that's well, going to make 2008 we're, we're, you know, look so, like prosperity. Peter, 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 can you jump in real quick? Yes, you can. Please. <laughs> Peter, how are you? Nice yeah. to see you. <laughs> you know, I, I just want to put forward, I mean, I think the, the focus, the conversation has kind of been overly, uh, overly uh, focused in one particular area. Like, I don't see how we can blame the entire recession or the whole fiscal crisis upon the Fed. And I also don't oh, I really see. see that the solution to everything is going to be strictly in monetary policy. You may think, and I think most people generally agree that right, there is, right. and even in your introduction, yeah. you talked about that there's overall political crisis. And I think, I think it would be behoove us to talk more about how maybe the Fed fits into that. But right. it's not just the Fed or nothing and the Fed's going to solve it. Because I don't believe just yeah, well, the Congress did help. It wasn't only well, the Fed. Well, that's that's, that's, that's a really important point. And it's, in fact, the point that Bernanke made. In his testimony, which was he said, I need some help from Congress. You guys have a job too. Fiscal policy and monetary policy work together. And nobody but, but, but he's but he's but he's wrong and he, he knows that, right? So I mean we can say whatever, but, but like, what? he's wrong. Bernanke's wrong. Well, he on, lies too. He's not just wrong. I mean, what what you know, monetarists on the right and Keynesians on the left came to uh, an understanding of in the '90s or whatever is that the primary driver of business cycles is action by the Federal Reserve. Well, they were and wrong. Ben Bernanke, ben Bernanke can alleviate the entire recession by himself if he so chose. No, he can't. He could make it much worse. No, but the, here's, 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 here's my point, though. Here's my, here's and, my, and, he, and he has said that. He, here, here's my point. Here's my meta point, which is important. Yeah. And I think for people at home, this is very important. The, you, Peter Schiff, your views have a lot of traction in the Republican Party. Not not, not really. really. Yeah, no. but, Maybe with Ron Paul, but compared, not. I yes. mean, he's not the typical Republican. Well, here, look. I'll show you. I'll show you. Let me. Let's, let's show Mitt Romney talking about. Bernanke have a job in your administration. Uh, no, I'd be looking for somebody new. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I think Ben Bernanke has, uh, uh, has overinflated the amount of uh, currency that he's created. Uh, QE2 did not work. It did not get Americans back to work. It did not get the economy going again. Now, the, the, my, my, my point here is that the position that you just said, Carl, you just said Ben Bernanke can solve this by himself, which is a, which is a, which is a, view, a view you never hear articulated anywhere in politics. My, my point is that there is an asymmetric there is an asymmetry in politics and in the debate we have, which is that the views that, 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 that Peter have articulated have gained a lot of traction. They're known on the Internet. I didn't realize until very recently that there was essentially the view that you are articulating and, in fact, that a lot of economists have been saying, right, that, that, right. that the Fed is doing too little, that actually the Fed could, could solve the business cycle. And so what it seems to me is that the seesaw is being sat on um, only on one side, and that's well, part of what's producing the, the, the Fed in action. Well, so it has been. Literally every single mainstream economist I know thinks the Fed has done too little um, and <laughs> that's the problem uh, the, These guys are wrong. The, this is actually a really really unusual time for the Fed because the Fed has often over its history faced political pressure but it's actually usually from the left political pressure because it's not doing enough about employment and this is a, a very new time where it's facing a lot of political pressure from the right from people who are paranoid about inflation going crazy and uh, are are really paranoid about how they act and I think that they have to respond to that this pressure because one of the things we know when we look at the history of central banking is that an independent central bank is actually what prevents inflation from getting out of control right and what they're fearful of is losing that independence because we know that if we turn our central banking over to people like Ron Paul, we will end up with a disaster. Oh. And so we've got to be, a, they've got to balance a very tight line of being able to work within the political system and not lose that independence, but yet do the actions that we want them to do in order to, you know, help the economy. Last word, remember, it, inflation is going to run out of control. It's going to devastate the economy. The Fed has no tools now to contain it because if they have to raise interest rates in order to fight the inflation genie that they've let out of the bottle, they're, the U.S. government's going to have to default on its bonds. We're going to have failures in the banking system without any bailouts. It's going to be a, a much bigger collapse than what happened in 08. 
When are we going to have the inflation? Yeah. It's already here. Have you, have you bought it? Right, we have, we have this on video. Have you been to a supermarket? Yeah, this going we have this, we have oh, this on right. video. I want a real, I want a real bet. Right, Peter, Peter Schiff, president bet. of the brokerage for Euro Pacific Capital. Thank you for your time this morning. I really appreciate sure. it. <laughs> How Bill Clinton messed up Barack Obama's week. Up next. We can have a bet.